We begin this morning with the news that France is getting ready for the next month's return of 26 looted colonial-era artifacts to the government of Benin. Earlier, President Emmanuel Macron received a delegation from the country at the Kambali Museum, where the artworks were on display until Sunday. The wooden anthropomorphic statues, royal thrones, and sacred altars from the collection known as Abomey Treasures were stolen by the French army 129 years ago. So far, France has only turned one item, a sword handed to the Army Museum in Senegal. But Mr. Macron is calling for more such items to be returned. In November 2017, in Ouagadougou. In 2017, in Ouagadougou, I pledged to the students to restitute. I was convinced that France could not remain passive to the fact that 95% of the African heritage is located outside of Africa. Every youth needs to seize its heritage to build a better future, to recover its power and its mysteries. There was no reason for the youth of Africa to be deprived of its heritage. These works will return home. They will find the men and women who will be able to understand the full power behind these works. These works will return to territories that they left so long ago and they will recover all their meaning there. Judging by the great resonance on the international level, France and Bene are showing the world an example of museum and heritage cooperation through this restitution. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the 26 pieces of art that are shown here for the first time all together are representing an exceptional and irreplaceable cultural heritage for the people of Bene. They constitute an undeniable part of the cultural and religious identity of our country. Right, and for the first time ever, a stolen Benin bronze artifact has been handed back to Nigeria. Jesus College at Cambridge in the United Kingdom handed the Hokoko, a sculptor of a cockroach stolen from the palace of the Oba of Benin in 1897, back to Nigeria on Wednesday, October 27th. His Royal Highness Prince Hagese uh, Eregiowa attended the event to receive the artifact on behalf of the country. The hope is that this opens the door for tens of thousands of other Benin bronzes being held in Western institutions to also be returned back to where they were stolen from. Uh, Arise News correspondent Leila Johnson Salami attended the event and sends this report. In 1897, a Benin bronze sculpture of a cockerel was stolen from the palace of the Oba of Benin. Eight years later, it ended up here at Jesus College, Cambridge University in the United Kingdom, handed to the college by a father of a student. Today, the college sets a new precedent, as for the first time in British history, a stolen Benin artifact is being handed back to Nigeria. I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Frank Pan Auditorium at Jesus College as we gather for the ceremony to formally hand over this Benin bronze, this Okoko, which does not belong to us. Together, we represent some, not all, of the party that will sign the legal documentation that will formalise the rightful ownership of this bronze and is the heart of this historic day. When one sees a wrong that is so egregious, when you notice it, the key institutional question, and maybe in fact the only institutional question one can ask, is how to right that wrong. Our journey in writing this wrong began with knowledge. It began with what we do as a university so well, and what we do at Jesus College with heart and with care. We teach, we educate. Jesus College today is demonstrating the need for a change of attitude in the perception of imperialism and the ownership of ancestral heirloom. By studying the circumstances of colonial activities with respect to illegally obtained heritage arts and coming to the conclusion that it, it is immoral to retain such items, Jesus College is indeed challenging the erroneous argument that stolen art cannot be returned because of the existence of different legal jurisdictions on the matter. I want to, on behalf of the National Commission for Museums and Monuments, uh, want to thank Jesus College for being the first in the United Kingdom to physically hand over one of the loot, the Benin loot of 1897. And, uh, this is uh, really a great example 
for other institutions and other countries to take you from. And uh, we look forward to going to Aberdeen to collect another piece. And also, hopefully, I'm sure, of course, optimistic that we're coming back again to Cambridge to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology to do the same process and uh, being the second largest holder of the Benin collections in the United Kingdom. What precedence does the return of Okuko set? Uh, well, clearly, um, you know, institutions have been hiding behind the cloak that they acquired these things, they were gifts and all of that. They did not loot them directly, just like some other holders of these artifacts. But now the precedent is that there is no excuse anymore. Jesus College researched and they took the noble decision that works that were looted, no matter how you obtain them, ought to be returned to their rightful place. So we are hoping that others take a cue from this. How do you personally feel towards the return of Okoko today? That's, um, the feeling is indescribable. Yeah. It's, it's pure joy. Um, even though in a paradoxical way, it's also the beginning of a long uh, battle for the return of the rest. Uh, Jesus College has done so well uh, as far as uh, private institutions go. Because the war, there's a dichotomy in the battle between um, artifacts held by uh, government institutions, uh, which have to, negotiate, have to be negotiated on, on that sovereign agreements, on the protocols and treaties, and the ones held by private institutions like Jesus College and Oxford and all other universities and museums, private museums, who don't have to go to the rigmarole of international sovereign negotiations. They can just call us and say, look, come pick up your thing, and we'll come. You know, and um, the change of attitude is quite commendable because it is the right thing to do. Uh, it's a matter of conscience, and it is the right thing to do. How did this all begin six years ago when you were still a student here at Cambridge? Yeah, so I was in first year, um, and Amate, um, who's another student, who was a year above me, raised it like, oh, have you seen that thing? Because I think I mentioned that I was interested in art. And that was kind of the beginning. We started drafting something. We had to present it to the students. Let's kind of get a student mandate so we can take this, present it to the college, at, col at college council. And that was how this conversation started. So there was a lot of conflict, I think, about what we were going to say in the proposal, how we were going to present it, what our case actually was going to be. Um, we had to do lots of research. You know, so we, we knew what we were, we were talking about. And then after a while, I think we did actually grow tired. Um, and you think that those things just kind of get lost and die in institutional memory, but it, it's nice that, like I said, that there was staff to keep that going and to revive that in a way that was coherent with how Jesus does things and makes decisions. And now it's going home. How responsive do you believe the British government are to the return of stolen artifacts? Yes, it's a process. Um, these artifacts are in two uh, different categories. The artifacts relating to uh, the, 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 the being held by private institutions are quite different from the one being held by government institutions, but uh, British Museum in particular. And uh, in the course of my interaction with the British Museum much earlier on, um, I'm told that uh, the artifacts were taken to the British Museum under an act of parliament. So it would take a parliamentary lobby and an act of parliament to effect the return of this act. Thank you so much um, for being here in the Frankopan Hall at, uh, at Jesus College for what I think has been a really um, historic occasion. Thank you so much. Uh, my final words are, it is done. <laughs> In a historical and very emotional day here at Cambridge University, the relentless push by several Nigerians over many years means that Nigeria has now opened the doors for many other African countries to demand that their artifacts are returned. The question is, how far will this go? Are we going to see other Western institutions following in the footsteps of Jesus College? Well, that remains to be seen, but this is certainly just the beginning. Leila Johnson Salami, Arise News, Cambridge. All right, we're coming to you. I mean, happy stories.
a peace Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic news for the people of Benin, especially the Oba of Benin, and the people of Bene, who are, you know, some justice is finally starting to be done. But it must be said that um, K. Bronley Museum in France has 70,000 stolen items. So that they've returned 26, as that report says, is really the tip of the iceberg. It's the mm -hmm. beginning of a process. But I want to raise something that I read about a, a gentleman from Benin here in Nigeria, from um, Edo State, called Zekla Okoro, I believe his name is. He's an artist. And he um, gave the British Museum this really beautiful work to show that the Benin um, civilization is still living and thriving. It's not to be referred to as ancient. Oh, this were their works then in 1897, as if everything has just died artistically. And also to persuade the British Museum to return some of their you know, artifacts, their historical artifacts. They accepted his piece, but didn't return anything. And I'm like, oh, nice try. And I also have to say, I'm looking right now at a petition that just closed two days ago. Amend the British Museum Act 1963 to allow for return of artifacts on a permanent basis. Because I've talked about it here before, the fact mm -hmm. that UK legislated their theft. Mm -hmm. And it only had 293 signatures. And it just closed two days ago. So a mm -hmm. lot more work really has to be done. And the sad reality, Dr. Abati, is check across all the major media. Only Arise is pushing this, is covering this. Wow. Well, I don't know how much time we have, because I would like to look at this from different perspectives. Uh, first, let's commend all the uh, persons, the groups, the uh, institutions that have pushed for this, starting with the Nigerian government, the palace of the Yoba of Benin, the uh, government of Edo State, and all those voices of reason that have fought to say that, look, as part of the legacy of colonialism and slavery, uh, that the British and other countries have no reason holding on to other people's legacy and historical artifacts. Even the Egyptians are still fighting the British to return the Patinum marbles, or what is called the Elgin. Uh, but in our particular case in Africa, only two countries have had anything returned. A sword in Senegal, and one other artifact in Madagascar. But Nigerians have been focused on this, uh, you know, for years. And even the present administration took up that battle and had been engaging the various countries that have Nigerian artifacts. With specific reference to Okuko, Okuko uh, is a major ancestral symbol within Edo culture. And it's also used, you know, to represent the symbol of the mother queen. Now, the uh, expedition, the British Punitive Expedition, as it is known, of February 18, uh, February 18, 1897, led to the stealing of hundreds of millions of artifacts from the ancient Benin Kingdom, including, you know, uh, uh, Okuko cockerels, including uh, also leopards and other artifacts. And the Okuko that was taken away from the Benin Kingdom at the time, there were more than 22. So this may be returned, but there are still others. And this particular one that was donated to the Jesus College in, uh, in uh, 1905, to, uh, in 1905 by a man called William Richard Neville. William Richard Neville went to uh, uh, Benin after the expedition, three months after and he collected a number of artifacts which he took back uh, to, to England. He was a Lagos resident, he was a banker, and he was given security protection to steal uh, those artifacts, and he brought them to Lagos, he later took them uh, to England, and he had an exhibition in the later part of May 1897 uh, in London. Much later, he did, donated it to uh, Jesus College of Cambridge, University uh, of Cambridge, where his daughter uh, was a student. Now, Neville died in 1929 at the age of, uh, 19, uh, of 79. But he was a different kind of, uh, you know, colonial person. He identified with the people. He was a good friend of King Nana of Koko. And all of, uh, yes, Ishakiri King. And when Nana of Koko returned from the Gold Coast, he came to stay with, uh, you know, Richard, William Richard Neville, uh, in Lagos. But that in itself does not uh, justify the uh, humanity or humanism of, uh, of uh, William uh, Richard Neville. This was stolen artifact. All of these stories that I have told 
can be found in Lut, uh, uh, Britain and the Benin provinces, a book written by Barnaby Phillips. Now there's another book, which is written by a, uh, a lady called, um, uh, a Ghanaian lady, you know, Mikael, or, you know, with Ore uh, Ogumbiyi. Uh, the book is, taken, is, is called Taking Up Space. These two young ladies were students at the uh, Jesus College in Cambridge, and they were both members of the African Caribbean Society. And they both were part of the struggle to say, look, these artifacts, you know, are part of colonial heritage, and they must be returned. And this Okuko was in a very prominent location in Jesus College. Uh, Ore Ogumbi wrote a chapter in the book on that reference called Blacktivism. And in that particular chapter, she gives a very detailed account of how black students and members of the, uh, the Afro-Caribbean society uh, in the University of Cambridge fought for this. On the basis of the activism, that Okuko was removed in 2016. And now in 2019, the university agreed to return it. So what has happened now, on the basis of this historical background provided in the two books that I have quoted, is momentous. It's a major victory for the Edo people, the uh, Edo kingdom, and also for Nigeria. Mm. And also, I guess, for Africa, uh, particularly now that France is talking about returning uh, 26 artifacts mm. uh, to the Republic of Benin, what is popularly known as the Abomi uh, treasures. France has it in its possession. 90,000 artifacts, you know, from uh, uh, its uh, francophone uh, units in uh, Africa. But we, ha we are lucky we have uh, President Macron who is interested in returning this. Germany bought some of its uh, artifacts uh, from, uh, from the United Kingdom because the British decided to start selling African treasures. Mm -hmm. And some of these countries, you know, are now cooperating to return. And in that regard, let's put on record the protest by uh, Chimamanda Adichie when she delivered a special lecture at the Ombud lecture about uh, one and a half months ago. And she called out the British to say, look, you the British, you, you are the biggest culprit and you must return these artifacts. Mm. So I think she too can take part of the uh, credit. Mm. So all these uh, you know, persons who have been pushing, uh, they deserve commendation. However, mm. When these artifacts eventually return to Nigeria, I hope that we will not play politics with it mm. or with them. I hope that the effort to make sure that these things are kept in a proper museum and uh, they are properly preserved will be efforts that will be born out of uh, common sense and mm. intelligence and competence mm. because Nigeria has a way of messing up every uh, good thing. I once mm. said on this uh, program, that some of our museums in Nigeria have been turned into pepper soup joints. Mm. So I've gone to some of these museums to go and take pepper soup and okay. attend the events. Mm. So these are not artifacts that can go to pepper soup joints, mm -hmm. except there is a, an intelligent framework mm -hmm. for turning those museums into mm -hmm. proper cultural centers and mm -hmm. that security is provided. Mm -hmm. There was an artifact that was returned to Nigeria long before now. One, mm -hmm. we have no proof of its existence or how it is being kept. Mm. So it's not enough for people to say, oh, mm. they are making political statements. We are making commonsensical statements. And mm. people in government should be people who are competent, who are intelligent enough mm -hmm. to understand the issues. Mm. Because of late, I get a lot of unintelligent responses, mm. you know, from people who just told the partisan line mm. uh, in assignments that they have been given where they have no ability and no knowledge. We should not do that with this. And we must spend money of our, on our museum. The Britain we are collecting these artifacts back from just released its budget is spending 850 million pounds sterling on culture, museums and the likes. How much are we spending? Food for thought. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll talk some more. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on Arise News. Moving on to business updates. Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. 
Good morning. Uh, it's been a fairly noisy uh, trading session over in Asia, basically. A lot of noise from central banks, uh, particularly uh, the Brazilian central bank, which hiked its interest rates by one and a half percent. Turkey actually cut, get this, cut its rates, even though it's got rampant inflation. Uh, and uh, it looks like the Bank of New Zealand will be raising sooner rather than later. So as far as the Asia Pacific markets are concerned, Bank of Japan decided to hold its monetary status uh, absolutely steady. Nikkei uh, slightly down about 1%, also cut its GDP uh, forecast for the country. Mainline China stocks also slipping very, very slightly indeed, slightly overnight. In fact, the whole index for the whole region down about a quarter of a percent. Nevertheless, China is ramping up coal imports, not from Australia, but from Russia, imported 3.7 million tonnes of thermal coal, primary fuel for electricity production, uh, in the month of September. That's according to... That's 28% up from August and 230% higher than a year ago, uh, despite um, reporting, uh, that, and this is despite the fact that no imports, of course, from Australia, or at least officially no imports from Australia as far as um, thermal coal is concerned. However, Australia's other exports to Japan jumped 24% from a year ago, mainly, even though there are tensions between the two countries, uh, mainly through meat uh, and uh, live animal products. Uh, and that's still actually that those exports are still rising. Let us recap the United States. Today, we're going to get Apple and Amazon. Uh, and although tech giants outperformed last night wasn't really enough to keep the nasdaq in record territory um if wall street if apple and amazon don't deliver what i think we can term as crowd pleasing results today um well we can batten down the hatches until the fomc starts to talk about when it's going to start to um uh, to, to to make the economy harder for everybody but that'll be next year so relatively um soft performance earnings out performance really hitting a wall of decline um and add into that the budget circus on uh, Capitol Hill and so on. And as I said, that um, up at that coming up FOMC meeting uh, next week, and I think that um, things are looking fairly, uh, as uh, people are short covering at the bed. But wait for this today. There's a big one coming up, Caterpillar results. Now, they make industrial equipment, as you probably know. Uh, the industrial giant generates a quarter of its income from uh, Asia Pacific region. And uh, China, in particular, will be looking at this to see whether or not, because this is how you actually granularly try to estimate what's going on in a country, their use of this kind of machinery. So it will be up today. So um, and that that really is in the uh, and we're going to get the G US GDP, sorry, the US, uh, US quarter three GDP uh, again today. Uh, UK budget and all that. We talked a bit about it yesterday. Um, Basically, I think what we saw there is is a political budget, um, very uh, an increase in tax and so on. But a big takeaway for me from it is that price rises are going to rocket next year, and uh, and inflation is going to grow more than the official forecaster thought at the beginning of the year. So um, it, the, the the chancellor said that household budgets are a bit uh, constrained at the moment. He, he took that on board. But it was down really to the, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to talk about this kind of political, philosophical shift in the Tory party towards uh, big, big spending. Public spending got a lot of uh, money in this. Um, again, good that that's happening. But of course, the downside of it is who's actually taking note of whether or not it's being spent properly. Um, oil prices down again overnight. That's because of uh, uh, full inventories or higher inventories in the United States. Um, but we, again, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll see where that goes. What I mean by that is it's been very volatile. And it's when it, as soon as it gets to that sort of $80 a barrel thing, then things start to slip back. And gold has been rising, not because of the, anything to do with the dollar, but because of global nerves um, rattled by this, this question that I began this report with. Is this inflation spiking or is it sticky? That's what we want to know. That's the global view. Right. Michael. Um, okay. Right. You reminded me of um, Dame Shirley Bassey's song, Hey Big Spender, there, when you're talking about the budget. What did you think of Rachel Reeves, who had to step in for Keir Starmer at short notice? And she said that it will be champagne quaffing bankers who are cheering on the budget with the cuts to shore up the city of London, I imagine. What are your thoughts on that? No, no, she 
wasn't. No, no, no. I was very impressed by her. She wasn't talking about bankers in the city of London. The quote about the champagne popping was on planes because um, it's a feeling that uh, because he's 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 reduced um, the, the the overall taxation on on re air tickets. It's to not the United encouraging. Kingdom. The yes. middle, there's, but there's also the reference to the surcharge as well. That's been decreased, which is hence the bankers reference. Well, I was listening to her on the radio this morning and her bankers reference was, in fact, she was talking about champagne sipping bankers in aeroplanes rejoicing in it. Um, not true, actually. Uh, but I think she did very well. It's a very, as I was saying yesterday, it's an extremely difficult job to do. She couldn't really do anything but applaud the sort of public spending. But what she, what, what she did so, which I thought was most important, and again, this is another takeaway that I have from the budget, is that um, it's middle income families that are feeling, now what that middle income is, not quite sure, but middle income families are feeling that the, the cost of living is rising inexorably. And I think she didn't feel as though there was enough help for that. Yet certainly some help for the poorer off, but not for middle income people. And that clearly is what politicians actually want to get hold of. So in answer to your question, I think she did a very good job. Yes. I do right too, but not, not to be argumentative. It's not only bankers that fly between the United Kingdom. She was saying that the focus was more on them than the common person. Well, uh, Michael, I wanted to draw your attention to some of the reactions. Richard Hoos, who is the chairman of the um, OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility, was saying that what uh, Britain needs to worry about more is uh, the impact of Brexit rather than uh, COVID, and that the impact of Brexit will be worse on the economy uh, than uh, COVID. Uh, do you agree with him? He says, look, leaving the EU will probably reduce the UK's uh, GDP by about 4%. And uh, COVID, the effect it will have on the economy may not be more than 2%. That's one. Two, France has now detained two British trawlers. One was detained for violating, uh, you know, um, uh, the rules. The other one, its uh, license was immediately withdrawn. Before now, the UK had been threatening to deal with France on this uh, fishy, fishing, fishing uh, privileges uh, matter. Where do we think we're going with that from this point onwards? Would right, there be retaliation first. from the UK? Fisherman first. Um, I was listening to somebody just before we came on air, uh, one of the fishermen talking about this, this situation. He feels as though it's going to escalate. The French have said it is going to escalate and it will not only spill out, for, it, won't, it won't just be detaining trawlers, it'll spill out under, under all sorts of trade relations that we have with France. What he was saying was that th these, are, these are matters which are nothing to do with Brexit. They're, they're, they've been going on for years and nobody has had the guts or the courage to actually sees this that what all what fishermen both english and french want to do is have a mutually beneficial existence together and they know that they can only get that by sitting down and, and actually putting right what's been what's what's been forgotten not been actually nailed down for years it's not just to do with brexit although brexit has caused every, everybody's jumping on that kind of bandwagon the fact that this fisherman who is the who is the chairman of the of the fishing committee was actually saying that it's about time now that the politicians instead of saber rattling both sides of the channel got down to discussing exactly where we can and we can't fish as long as it's fair nobody will mind they feel it's not fair at the moment so i think the escalation is going to continue and i think the saber rattling unfortunately will still continue as far as official forecasts are concerned well the office for budget responsibility got it wrong at the beginning of the year they said this inflation was only going to be just above three percent now it's looking like it's going to be five percent they also said that the hit to the economy would be three percent of it it isn't it's only two percent so there's a lot of these official forecasts that are adrift at the moment again i i, I mean I, I listen to them they're quite interesting who knows does anybody go back to them and look at them and examine them in a year's time no i don't think so what are, what are more people worried about they're more worried about household bills going up the price of living is increasing it's a price of living crisis in this country and that really is what i think is going to is going to hit us all not not, not the long term um, not the long term forecast from the office of budget responsibility and the rest of them all right michael i had a lot to say about that budget maybe i'll take you on it tomorrow because there's so much 
Rishi Sunak lied his way through. I mean, I can start pointing it out to you. Wasn't factoring inflation rates on household living. Even the foreign aid that was reduced to 0.5%, now pushed up 0.7% again by 2023, 20, 20, 2024. When you see how nebulous the foreign aid is, you'll be shocked. Giving COVID vaccines as part of foreign aid, you know, everything just all padded up. The, 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 those in, cha in, in, term, in charge of infrastructure, homes and buildings, you know, the, the, the benchmark of 300,000 homes and is not making appropriate provision for it. It says it's going to be a tax cap of one billion. I mean, there's so much to pick out of that budget. I, I particularly am not impressed. I just think Richie Sunak, you know, got his way. And unfortunately, uh, Kiastama wasn't around due to COVID to be able to challenge him and call him out on some things. That's what I think about the budget. But thank you so much for your time, Michael, as always. Really appreciate you. Move to Adesua Morwa real quickly. Great to have you, Adesua. Good morning, Rufai, Tundu, and Dr. Vati. Indeed, the Labour leader was gutted yesterday when his lateral flow test came back positive, and two other shadow secretaries he was with uh, came out negative, and they had to attend the uh, budget defence by Rishi Sunak. Uh, but let's look at the latest data from the pandemic globally. Uh, we have the latest weekly breakdown by the WHO epidemiological report, but the Johns Hopkins University provides us with all the figures that we need. Now, after months of decline, uh, unfortunately, I can tell you that the global COVID-19 cases and deaths numbers rose slightly week on week. There were more than 2.9 million infections and over 49,000 deaths in the last week. And that's rising by 4% and 5% respectively. Now, Europe reported its fourth consecutive week of increase with We've been seeing the increase coming in from Europe, but it's the fourth consecutive week they're, they're seeing that. 18% uh, rise compared to the previous week, uh, followed by the Western Pacific region. Uh, we also saw, according to WHO, significant decrease in weekly coronavirus cases reported from the African region, falling by 21%. Now, the largest decline in new weekly deaths was also reported from the Western Pacific region, showing a 13% decrease as compared to the previous week. Here in Nigeria, another 166 infections and two COVID-19 related deaths were reported by the NCDC. Delta State led the pack with the most cases for the last 24 hour period. It was followed by the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. However, the NCDC says there was a backlog of cases and deaths coming in from Kebi, Enugu, and Lagos State. And that's the outlook for Nigeria. Well, speaking about Lagos State, the incident commander, who is also the governor, Babajide Sonwolu, has expressed concerns over an impending fourth wave of the pandemic as the Utah approaches. Now, he made this known while flagging off a COVID mass vaccination program for Lagos State. The program aims to vaccinate 4 million residents before the end of this year. Let me tell you how this is going to happen or how it's supposed to work. Governor Sonwul says in all the 205 public primary health centers, 14 of the state's secondary and tertiary hospitals, there will be vaccination sites. There would also be mobile vans that would go to hard reach areas. But that's not all. The private sector has finally come on board. The partnership will see over 400 private health care centers across seven underserved local government areas in the state participate in the inoculation exercise. But while the vaccines remain free in the public facilities, those who decide to go to the private facilities will have to part with an administration fee of 6,000 naira. Now, we don't know if that's per job or it's for the full inoculation. Uh, although Lagos has vaccinated just a little above, fully vaccinated a little above 550,000 people, uh, which is also 4% of the targeted population in the state, Governor Sonwolu announced yesterday that the state will not be towing the lines of Edo or Shun uh, Undo with vaccine, uh, vaccine mandates. It says it's not compulsory, but 
he's uh, appealing to the people to get vaccinated. This campaign, which is in collaboration with the NPHCDA and the, the uh, private uh, sector, as I said earlier, uh, is for those age 18 and above and will run till the 25th of December, Christmas Day. Away from Nigeria, U.S. pharmaceutical company Merck has agreed to allow drug makers to produce its COVID-19 pill, and that's according to a United Nations body. The medicines patent pool said it had signed a voluntary licensing agreement for the monopovia. It's the COVID pill reported to cut hospitalization or death in half if taken five days uh, of infection onset. This stand by Merck, of course, is in stark contrast to messenger mRNA manufacturers such as Pfizer and Moderna, who have so far rejected uh, sharing their vaccine technology. And finally, in the U.S., 21 Republican state attorneys general sent a letter to President Joe Biden saying they think his COVID-19 vaccination mandate for federal contractors stands on shaky legal ground. They say it's also confusing to the contractors and could exacerbate supply chain problems in the country. I'm, so I, I'm really excited about what Merck is doing and, and kudos to Merck. But the question is, how yeah. do they make money then? Do they retain the intellectual property on the end? And you know, you pay royalties sort of, because I mean, this looks too good to be true from this a This is royalty farmer. free. Royalty free too? So all the intellectual property, everything for yeah. free? Wow, the world is a better place today. Yes. Well, but what Mike has decided <laughs> with regard to monopiravi, you know, through the uh, medicine yeah. patent pool that is based in Geneva, which is a United Nations organization, is consistent with what the WHO, the United Nations, the U.S., and other groups have been asking for, which is that, look, Big Pharma mm -hmm. should buy into the idea of... Uh, global vaccine equity, uh, global vaccine solidarity, and provide opportunities for production hubs around the world. And we're hoping that this pill, you know, with this groundbreaking frontline, you know, uh, effort by Merck, uh, collaborating with the MPP uh, in Geneva, will also encourage other pharmaceutical companies to toe the same path. Because before now, other pharmaceutical companies I've just been totally indifferent. So I think this is different, uh, this is, uh, different and it's probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you know, it will provide the necessary opportunities, particularly for low and middle income countries uh, that have been uh, uh, targeted. As for Lagos State, yes, good news. Uh, Lagos State always provides updates. First phase of the uh, vaccination they were able to do up to about uh, 250,000. Second phase with Moderna, they were able to do about 500,000. On the whole, they've been able to achieve 4%. But with this latest effort to open up vaccination centers in all the 57 uh, local government and uh, development uh, uh, areas in Lagos, and also to collaborate with private uh, hospitals or private centers, the plan is to be able to move this close to the 30% target that the Lagos State government had in mind. You know, and all of this is to prepare for any likely upsurge uh, in uh, you know, uh, infection rate, and which is not something that you can rule out. In Singapore, Singapore opened up a little bit, but in the last week, there's been a great upsurge in the infection rate. Even the death rate has gone up, the highest since uh, Singapore uh, recorded uh, COVID-19. And despite the fact that in Singapore, 80% of the population is uh, you know, fully vaccinated. So I think that what they are doing in Lagos State is to be commended. And we hope that they support the promise that they will collaborate with uh, the uh, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. Faisal Shaib was at that event yesterday, would uh, be fruitful. However, when you say the private sector, private hospitals can charge administrative fees, I think it's important to put a specific cap on what that administrative fee will be. Otherwise, you'll find that many people will be restricted, they will be disadvantaged, because if you go to uh, a private hospital in Ajangbadi, you know, maybe they will ask you to pay a particular kind of administrative fee. But if you come to, to know, where is that place you live in Lagos? 
Uh, you know, well, okay. You know, if you come to where the big people live, you know, maybe they will ask you to pay <laughs> something bigger. And that could create problems of uh, equity. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the governor said 6,000 Naira. <laughs> well, I, I hope they will abide by that. You know how these things work. Thank you so much, Adesra. <laughs>